the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Yet, it is the leading exporter of regime change wars. In 2003, a coalition led by the United States invaded Iraq to overthrow the government of Saddam Hussein on the pretext that Saddam was developing weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs. For example, they can produce anthrax and botulinum toxin. In fact, they can produce enough dry biological agent in a single month to kill thousands upon thousands of people. Then U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell was the Bush administration's chief salesman of the decision to invade and occupy Iraq. In February 2003, Powell outlined the United States' case that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction at the U.N., making the argument for the invasion that would happen the following month. As U.N. inspectors in Iraq continued their search for weapons of mass destruction, Han Blix, the chief weapons inspector for the United Nations, argued for sufficient time. It will not take years, nor weeks, but months. Neither governments nor inspectors would want disarmament inspection to go on forever. But the U.S. Secretary of State did not want any more arms inspections. He called for prompt action. The gravity of this moment is matched by the gravity of the threat that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction posed to the world. Others urged for restraint. To what extent do the nature and scope of the threat justify the recourse to force? How do we make sure that the tremendous risks of such intervention are actually kept under control? Without a consensus in the UN Security Council, U.S.-led coalition forces set a deadline for military action. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict. Saddam refused to leave. The shock and awe airstrikes, as they were called, were launched in March 2003. Then the U.S. military, backed by Poland, Australia, and Britain, pushed into Iraq. We got him. After an intense manhunt, Saddam was captured, put on trial, and executed. But there was a problem. No weapons of mass destruction had been found. What ensued was years of hardship that resulted in the displacement and death of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi people. Questions about the legitimacy of the invasion and the subsequent war were soon raised bold lies or a failure of intelligence? That's a question many have been asking for years. Unfortunately, the U.S. Congress never investigated Powell's use of the intelligence he was given. I think that Colin Powell had gone through a lot of material, and, and we know that he had thrown out a lot of it and said, this doesn't hold water. But he was also a good soldier and loyal to his president. And I think what they felt was that the inspector's reports had not really given any ground for them to go in. And they needed to justify, especially vis-a-vis -vis American public opinion, that there were reasons to go in. So when we didn't present those facts, well, they sent Colin Powell. Powell has since called his 2003 presentation a blot on his record. But for the Iraqi people, this blot led directly to the devastation of their homeland. After the last of U.S. troops left in 2011, ISIL, one of the most brutal terror groups the world has ever seen, emerged to plunge the nation back into war. People is killed here yeah, without any guilty, without anything. Also, my, my country is destroyed. You know, there is no, uh, no electricity, no service, the, the, everything, building is uh, destroyed. The Iraq War was perhaps the greatest public display of the American appetite for foreign intervention. But the U.S. strategy for regime change hasn't always been so public. Covert operations by the U.S.'s intelligence apparatus are more the rule than the exception. Mossadegh was the democratically elected prime minister of Iran between 1951 and 1953. He led efforts to nationalize Iran's oil industry, which had been built and run by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, a company that was later renamed British Petroleum. 
a hugely popular move within Iran. It caused great consternation among American and British oil interests. In August 1953, Mossadegh's government was overthrown in a coup after the Shah, the ruler of Iran, issued a decree to dismiss him from office. Abdullah Anvar is a researcher in Tehran and an eyewitness of the 1953 coup. With Mossadegh taking office, we had gotten rid of tyranny after 2,500 years. People could talk freely, and you could be confident that if you went out of your house, you wouldn't be caught by the Savic secret police. On August 19, 1953, a pro-Shah riot swept across the capital, with royalists overthrowing the Mossadegh government. I heard people had taken to the streets and there was chaos. I heard police were involved and many people were killed. Then they seized power. The Shah flew to Baghdad and then to Italy, while Tehran was the scene of massive protests and clashes between pro-monarchy forces and Mossadegh loyalists, leaving hundreds dead in firefights in the streets of Tehran. Following the coup, Mossadegh was sentenced to three years in prison. He was kept under house arrest until 1967. In August 2013, the U.S. government formally acknowledged America's role in the coup by releasing a bulk of previously classified government documents, which revealed it was in charge of both the planning and the execution of the coup. The CIA is quoted acknowledging the coup was carried out under CIA direction and as an act of U.S. foreign policy conceived and approved at the highest levels of government. Papers released by the U.S. State Department in 2017 show American fears over the spread of communism in the region, as well as the British desire to regain access to Iran's oil industry, which had been nationalized by Mossadegh, were key to the decision. The coup changed and shaped modern Iranian history, as well as its relationship with the West, especially the U.S. Yeah, I think one of the things that's often uh, easy to miss and to forget uh, when, we, when we look at the history of U.S.-Iran relations is how uh, is the fact that it hasn't always been as acrimonious as it has been uh, during the last 40 years. The admiration for the United States really began to evaporate after the, uh, in 1953 when the CIA backed a coup against a very popular, uh, acclaimed and constitutionally elected prime minister in Iran. Uh, in the decades that followed, the U.S. increasingly gave uh, support, though not always unqualified support, but, but increasingly support to uh, the Shah of Iran, who, the, the last king of Iran, who became increasingly dictatorial uh, in, his, uh, in his rule. The bitter taste of American interventionism is still on the tongues of many Iranians. At that time, America had a role, and they still have a role today. They are always there. Britain is the main player with its politics and American power helps it. It is the case in every country, not just Iran. U.S. foreign policy has wreaked havoc in the Middle East, but the U.S. has always had the tightest grip on what it deems as its own backyard, Latin America. Every year on April 19th, hundreds of Cubans, including campaign veterans, gather in the small town of Playa Giron to commemorate their victory at the Bay of Pigs. The significance of it was the defeat of imperialism. When they landed, we went against them and defeated the mercenaries so they won't come again. The Bay of Pigs is an isolated inlet on Cuban's southern coast, some 200 kilometers from the capital, Havana. It was here in April 1961 that some 1,400 American-backed anti-Castro Cuban exiles, trained and armed by the CIA, came ashore. The CIA had predicted that once the invading force landed on the beaches, there would be a popular uprising here against Fidel Castro. In the end, the exact opposite happened. The vast majority of Cubans rallied in support of the government. Fidel Castro took personal charge of the counterattack, and in less than 72 hours of heavy fighting, it was over. However, more than half a century later, it's a battle that continues to cast a shadow across troubled relations between the United States and Cuba. Thank you. We will not lift sanctions on the Cuban regime until it delivers full political freedom for the Cuban people. After the CIA-backed military coup failed, in 1962, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed a full embargo on trade with Cuba. 
Sectors like healthcare, agriculture, and education in Cuba face barriers, hindering the purchase of items, tools, and machinery. The quality of life of the children would improve if the blockade did not exist. Cuban authorities say the embargo is the main obstacle for the island's economic development. Every country in the world has now registered its opposition. Most countries of the world do trade with Cuba. As you saw, China has significant trade relations with Cuba. And this tells the, the United States that it's acting against the world. And uh, it's not good for the United States. The United States has become the isolated one. It, they were put in place in 1962 as part of an effort to overthrow the Cuban government. Unfortunately, Cuba is only one snapshot of U.S. campaigns for regime change in Latin America and beyond. According to an article published by Foreign Policy in 2013, other confirmed cases of the CIA's globe-spanning campaigns of coups with government documents as proof included Guatemala in 1954, the Dominican Republic in 1961, Brazil in 1964, and Chile in 1973. In addition to direct regime change campaigns, the U.S. has interfered in the national elections of other countries, including Japan in the 1950s and 1960s and Lebanon in 1957. According to one study, the U.S. performed at least 81 overt and covert known interventions in foreign elections during the period of 1946 to 2000. There have been no shortage of calls both in and outside the U.S. for an end to the country's covert regime change operations and wars. But the U.S. political and military machine rolls on. American film director and producer Oliver Stone spoke candidly about the major mistakes of U.S. interventionism. Thinking you're right about everything and uh, thinking you're the good guy is a huge mistake. But it, the whole attitude we took to the third world, India among them, in the 1950s under John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower, set a horrible precedent for the United States. We were regarded badly by most of the third world, whereas the Soviet Union was regarded in a much better light as a friend to third world ambitions. Uh, so the United States repeatedly in Vietnam, in third world, in its support of colonialism in, in Africa and in, in Asia and in the Middle East has crossed many ethnic barriers and broken many people's hearts and killed many people. And, we haven't, and we've done it benignly through proxies, whether it's the Shah of Iran or Saudi Arabia. We've always worked. We're very good behind the scenes. I think we're expert at public relations. We're expert at controlling regimes. We got rid of the Iranian regime when it became too independent. We got rid of the uh, Indonesian regime when it became too independent. These are very rich, important countries. We have been manipulating behind the scenes with public relations, advertising firms, money, uh, banks. Whether it's the scars of war left in the Middle East by U.S. military action or the economic and personal hardships the people of Cuba are suffering as a result of American trade sanctions, the legacy of U.S. interventionism will continue to weigh on the shoulders of the global community for many years to come.